and I'm joining you today from our UGA Aquarium here on Skidaway Island, right near Savannah, Georgia. Um, and we are excited to take you on a virtual tour of some of the touch tanks that we have here at the aquarium, um, and also introduce you to some of the live animals that live in those touch tanks. Before we actually start our content, I do wanna share a couple of tips and tricks um, that you might find useful during the program. I'll be moderating and uh, monitoring that chat box throughout the program. So if you just joined us, you can find the chat box by hovering on the toolbar at the bottom of the screen, hitting the word chat, and then at any point you can enter your questions there and I'll make sure that our presenters um, get those questions and are able to respond. Um, again, if you have any technical difficulties as well, that would be the place to report it in that chat box. Um, and you will notice that your video and microphone will stay off um, for the whole program. Um, you are gonna hear from two marine educators, Kim and Rachel. First, Kim will take you behind the scenes on the touch tank system um, and how we care for it. And then Rachel's gonna pull out some of the live animals from that exhibit and introduce you to them. Um, and all of our animals here at the aquarium are ones that you can find right here in coastal Georgia. Um, so we're really excited to get to share not just the animals, but also the habitat that they would live in in the wild. Um, and all the animals in our touch tank live at the bottom of tidal rivers including rivers like the Skidaway River that runs right behind our aquarium building here. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kim, who's gonna start us on that virtual tour on the banks of the Skidaway River. All right, thank you, Kayla. Uh, good morning, everyone. So as Kayla said, I am Kim. Um, I'm one of the Marine Education Fellows at the UGA Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant um, at the UGA Aquarium. and. As she said, I'm gonna start off um, with sharing a little slideshow about uh, the touch tanks and the water and how we care for them. So we're gonna start here at the Skidaway River. Um, the Skidaway River is the river that runs along the back side of our aquarium. And I'm not just mentioning it because it's absolutely beautiful. I'm also mentioning it because this is exactly where we get all of our water from. It's also where we get a lot of our animals from. So. To start, the water here is actually brackish. That means it's partially salty and partially fresh. This is because it actually leads all the way out into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and if you actually know the answer to this question, go ahead and throw it in the chat box. But does anyone know what the area is where the ocean meets the river? Um, if you do, like I said, throw it into the chat box at Kayla and we'll see who knows that before we get started, but I'm gonna keep going. So as I said, the water is brackish, so partly salty, partly fresh. Um, the water, as you can see here, is also not very clear, um, which in aquariums is really nice to have clear water. Um, so in this water, there's a lot of algae and a lot of sediment, which isn't necessarily harmful, but in our aquarium, we go ahead and filter some of that out. And we're gonna show you how it goes from this river into our building. Um, but first, Kayla, did you have any answers for that? We did have two responses one for delta and one for estuary. Awesome, so the answer for that is estuary. Um, so where that fresh water meets that salty water from the ocean to the river, that is an estuary. So we do have estuary water um, in our aquarium. All right, and so how we get our water from the river into our building, we start with the UGA Skidaway Institute of Oceanography pump that's located on the Skateaway Institute dock. Um, it's shown here with that red arrow. It's a large, large pump, and it pumps a bunch of that water up from the river all the way down the dock and then into our building. But as I said before, there's a few steps in between um, getting into the building and into our tanks. So next we go ahead and put all of that water through our large filter beds that are located outside. These filter beds don't get out absolutely everything um, because there are a lot of healthy and natural things that are perfectly fine to have in our aquarium water, but we filter out a lot of the rocks, large sediments, um, things like leaves, any debris. We keep all of that stuff out of the water before we pump it into our aquarium. This also helps from clogging up our piping system. So next, after the filter beds and think a lot of that debris is filtered out, we go ahead and pump it right inside. So it starts by being pumped into that uh, large dark gray pipe that you can see is pointed out by the red arrow. 
Um, and that water can flow through the majority of our aquarium. But specifically, you can also see it runs into that white pipe, which is pointed out by the green arrow. Um, and these are some of our touch tanks that are located in our day group room um, for some of our programs. And so we're going to start here. And before I get too far into this slide, I'm going to just ask anyone if you know the answer to what an airstone does, um, go ahead and throw that in the chat box, but I'm going to start explaining the water flow first. Um, so the water flow for our uh, touch tanks in particular, all of that water goes through those pipings and then we have the ability to change how quickly or how slowly we want the water to run. We may want the water to run faster so we can stir up some of that sediment and get debris out. We may want the water to run a lot slower. So it's just having a small amount of water running over the animals um, at the time. So we change that throughout the day, depending on what we're doing, whether we're cleaning or if we're just leaving the water there. This also keeps from using an excess of water um, at any point in time. So did we get any answers for what the air stones do? We did not, so it'll be exciting to find out what, they, what they're used for. All right, so um, the air stones are actually to put oxygen into the water. So unlike you and I, these animals that we're gonna be talking about today don't have lungs, but they do have gills. And so they still need oxygen uh, and they need to get the oxygen somehow. And usually there's some wave action and some stuff stirring up some of the oxygen into the water. Uh, here we put air stones there to put the oxygen directly into the water, make it a little bit easier and make sure all of our animals are happy. All right, and then moving on, this is just an overview of the untreated seawater tanks. Um, all of that dark spot that you see, there are actually mussels, it's not dirt, but this is a tank that we clean regularly every day. So the water that comes out of the river is pure skidaway water. So there's nothing really treated into it. Um, we just pull up the large uh, bits and pieces. And then we go ahead and scrub a bunch of the algae down off of the tanks each day just to make sure that it's aesthetically pleasing for those that are using um, our day group room touch tanks. But we're going to go through the cleaning process here. So to start cleaning it, we go ahead by removing the standpipe. If you saw in the last picture, it stands up and it actually blocks all of that water from just going through um, the tank. There is a small hole there and we block it with the standpipe. This also allows the water to be at a certain level and just slowly flow through. Um, like I said, there's water just constantly being put into the tanks, but not a lot all at once. So to clean it, we go ahead and remove that standpipe, as you can see Rachel's doing here in these lovely pictures. And then all of that water uh, drains out through the bottom. We then have a bunch of different brushes and different things that we scrub our tanks with. We scrub all the algae and different debris off of the sides. We also have different scrubs for the air stones and for tubing, just to make sure everything is clean. Um, so that way we can actually use these touch tanks for our public programs. So you might have wondered where all of that water goes. We don't just dump it out onto the floor um, and we are inside, so we can't just dump it outside directly. We have a ditch that actually runs along the bottom of our touch tanks. So pointed at by that red arrow is actually the opposite side of that standpipe. So those pipes actually lead directly into the ditch. So when we remove the standpipe, the water runs through there and, and into the ditch. Um, and then pointed out by the green arrow, there's actually a drain right there that we'll talk about where it leads, but that drain is covered um, by a mesh piece to keep any leaves, any shells, any critters that might end up into our ditch to keep from getting clogged or hurt in any of our piping systems. But this is where all of the water runs to. All right, and if you go ahead and zoom in, this is just a zoomed in part of that picture off to the left there. That's the drain with the pipe and, I'm um, sorry, with the mesh covering. And then it actually leads right back into our marsh. So we recycle our water. All of that water is just um, filtered a little bit to take out some of that debris. And then we recycle it right back into our marsh right behind our aquarium. Another way that we get water into our touch tanks, because we do have public touch tanks along with our day group room touch tanks, we have water pumped from the Skidaway Institute dock into our filter beds and then actually into a large reservoir that's behind our aquarium. These are some of the piping systems that are behind our aquarium. 
and we actually treat this water. This is because when you walk into an aquarium and the public touch tanks, you want it to be a little more aesthetically pleasing. So we go ahead and treat for any harmful bacteria that may or may not be in there. Um, and also to get rid of a lot of that algae. So when you see the tanks, it's nice and clear um, and a little bit more pleasing to the eye. And the way that we move all of our water from the back of our aquarium into our front public touch tanks, unfortunately, we don't have any piping that goes out into the front of the aquarium where the public touch tanks are, um, we use our handy dandy uh, trash can. Uh, it's not for trash, it's just for water, clean water at that. Um, and then we also add things like instant ocean, which is just additional salt, um, pristine, salinity, prime, a bunch of other additives to just make sure um, everything looks clean and clear for our guests um, and for our animals. So, we do things like instant ocean to check and make sure the salinity is right for our animals. If you know the definition of salinity, go ahead and throw that in the box and we'll go over that later. Um, and we also do testing for other levels like nitrates and phosphates. But before I get ahead of myself, we also have these smaller filters similar to the filter beds that we talked about before. If you look at the top right where that long filter is, it starts with the water on the left and it moves to the right. It goes through some rocks to do physical filtration and through some of our filter socks, which you can see on the bottom. And we go ahead and clean those filter socks a few times a week and we'll replace some of the water just to make sure everything stays clean and clear um, in our tanks at all times. Kayla, did we get any responses for what salinity is? We did. We got a lot of responses for this one. And so Drew, Ipsita, um, Rachel, um, all sorts of people are saying that they think it's the amount of salt in the water or the level of salt in the water. Awesome. I did give it away a few minutes before because I was uh, mentioning how instant ocean is the salt. And you're right, it is the amount of salt in the water. So if we circle all the way back to when I was talking about the river leading out into the ocean, the ocean has a salinity of roughly 32 parts per thousand. It can fluctuate a little bit. Um, and fresh water is zero parts per thousand. Our Skidaway River um, is usually in the 20s. I've seen it as low as eight and it can go high um, to almost ocean levels. Um, but we try and make sure that it's in a good range for all of our animals because those animals do come mostly from our um, Skidaway River. All right. And to check all those levels, we use things and instrumentation like a YSI to go ahead and check all of those levels. The YSI can check levels for dissolved oxygen, it can check temperature, it can check, can, I'm sorry, it can detect the salinity. And so this is how we keep track of everything um, that we're testing for and make sure everything is good levels for all of our animals so they're happy and safe. All right. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Rachel now. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel, so I'm on another uh, Marine Education Fellow. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about food prep. So like Kim said, we have to take care of our touch tanks um, in many different ways. We have to clean them, but we also have to take care of the fish and the animals that live inside of the touch tanks and the other tanks of our aquarium. So these are just a few pictures of our food prep process. So as you can see um, in the upper uh, right-hand corner, that's Lisa, one of our aquarists, um, cutting up the food. So we actually feed, um, we feed our tanks with fish and shrimp as well as a food, food that we make in-house that kind of gives extra nutrients um, to our fish and our um, touch tank animals. And so these are things that they would find in their natural environment. So the fish and the shrimp that we're, we see here in these pictures, you can, you can act, we actually catch it right out on the Skidaway River. Also, if you notice, um, some of these containers have different sizes of fish and shrimp. Um, that's because our different fish and animals um, eat, have different sized mouths, so they need different sized food um, to eat uh, whenever we're feeding them. So you'll see um, at the end, I'm gonna actually do a feeding for our horseshoe crabs, and they get little chunks of food um, that is just small enough so that they can um, eat it easily. But you can, Kim, if you want to go ahead and stop the screen share, we'll move into our live animal portion. 
Um, so if you hover over into the upper right hand side, you'll see um, a little um, button that says speaker view. And so we want to make sure you, you want to make sure that you're on speaker view just so you can see the animals um, up close and see all the little details as I'm going through it. Um, if you want to go ahead and put in the chat box, if you remember um, what, where these animals live. Kayla mentioned in the beginning, so they're out in the Skidaway River, but what part of the river would they live in? Would they live in the top of the river, in the middle area, or on the bottom? Does anybody have any ideas about that? Um, these animals are all called benthic marine invertebrates that we're going to be talking about, and so that might give you a hint if you know what any of those words mean. Kayla, did we have some answers? We did. Uh, Nina and Rachel and Michael and Maggie are all saying the bottom. Awesome, yeah, that's correct. So benthic actually means bottom and then marine is salt water and, or uh, salty conditions. And then invertebrate means that they don't have any bones. So these animals are gonna live at the bottom. They're in marine water, so salty water, and they don't have any bones. So they have structures like shells or a hard exoskeleton that help protect their soft body. So that's gonna be something you're gonna see that's the same throughout all of our animals that we'll see today. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and grab our first animal. Um, and so I'll be right back. I'm going to go get it from our tank behind me. So this first animal, um, you can type in the chat box if you know what they're called. It kind of looks like a seashell that you would find on the beach. Um, so this animal is, like I said, it's soft bodied, so it doesn't have a, um, any bones. You can see it's soft body right here. Um, and then there's a harder part right here called the operculum. And that hard part kind of acts as a door so that um, you can, it can close itself up and protect its soft body if it feels threatened um, by any predators or other conditions. And it'll squeeze in um, its body into the shell and then it'll also close in some water as well. And this is actually Georgia's state uh, sea, or seashell. So it's called a knobbed whelk. And so Kayla, did we have anyone that had the correct answer to that? We had a really close one. We had a guess for conch. That's awesome. Yeah, so this does kind of look like a conch, but the difference is that conchs will live in more um, tropical waters. And so these whelks will be found all along the East Coast. Another big difference is that these, uh, that whelks are carnivorous. And so they actually eat other mollusks um, called mussels, which I'll show you in one minute. And uh, conchs, on the other hand, are herbivores. So they'll eat algaes and other things like that. So this whelk, like I said, it's called a knobbed whelk and it's Georgia's state seashell. Um, and you can find it, find shells like this along the beach and some of them will actually have live whelks inside. So I'm gonna go grab um, the mussels so you can see what this whelk will eat. So this is a mussel here. Um, you can see it has two shells, so one on either side. And inside here, we can't see right now because this one's all closed up, but there's a soft body inside there, which will be the food for the whelks. And so this is another kind of mollusk. I've used that word a couple times now. Does anyone know what a mollusk is? You can type it in the chat box if you have an idea. Um, so this is another type of whelk. This looks very similar to the knobbed whelk. It has little notches along the shell as well, but they're not as prominent as the knobbed whelk. But this one is actually called a lightning whelk. So the way that you can remember that's pretty easy is that this is a left-handed whelk. So it opens to the left. So if I were go to take, do a handshake with this shell, I would use my left hand to put it in this, uh, this way. But for knobbed whelks, and then the last whelk I'll show in a minute, they're actually right-handed. So it would open to the right-hand side. So you can remember lightning whelk, lightning starts with L and left starts with L. So you'd use your left hand if you were gonna shake a hand with the shell.
And Rachel, we did have some responses on what people thought a mollusk was. Um, some people shared, Drew said it, that it's a type of invertebrate. Um, Nina says that it's something that can be food for humans. Maggie shared that it's a soft bodied animal with zero to two shells. Um, a few people said hard exoskeletons. Um, yes, I think those were our responses. Yeah, so you guys were all uh, very correct. So we do use mollusks for food um, sometimes and there can there are some mollusks like um, octopi and other um, cephalopods that are considered mollusks but don't, don't have the hard shell that we would normally see. But whelks, they have a shell that's made out of calcium carbonate. So that's another way you can tell. And that's the same um, for mussels as well. So this is our last uh, whelk that I'm going to show you. So this is the last of the three um, common species you'll find on the coast of Georgia. We don't actually have a live one in our tanks today, but this is a shell of a channel whelk. So you can see it's much smoother. There's no knobs like you saw in the lightning whelk and the knobbed whelk. Um, and this is also a right-handed um, whelk. So if I were to go to shake a hand with this shell, I would use my right hand. Um, the other thing with the channel whelk that you can notice is that there's kind of like a channel dug out of this shell. And that's kind of where it gets its name and how you could remember if you saw this shell on the beach. So those are three types of whelks that we have here on the coast of Georgia. And when they start out, they start out very, very small. So I'm going to show a, a little tube that has some baby whelk shells. Hopefully you can see those. Um, so they're tiny. Um, that's how small they'll start out. And then they'll be in egg cases that you can sometimes find on the beach that look like this. And so each of these sections will have a bunch of little whelk shells inside. Um, and as they grow, they'll actually make more shell. So uh, you can sometimes see on the shell of the whelk. So on this channel whelk, you can kind of see there's a ridge here. So that's where it grew some new shell. And um, so whelks start out very small, but then they'll grow and then they'll leave their shell behind after they die. And so the shell can be used as a home for other animals and um, a nice place to hide. And so one of those animals that uses the whelk shell as a home is a hermit crab. So I'm going to go grab a hermit crab real quick and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Did we have any questions about the whelk, Kayla? No, but as Rachel is, is going ahead and selecting our hermit crab, if anyone has any questions at all about um, our whelks or any of the information about the touch tanks, please feel free to enter that in the chat box and we'll make sure that we answer your question. Or if anyone has any stories about whelks or animals like this that you've seen yourself. Definitely. Yeah, I it doesn't mention that, but I'll definitely answer questions along the way. And it does not look like we have any questions about whelks at this point, but we'll stop after the hermit crab. So if you think of anything that you're wondering about whelks, um, you can also ask it at that time. Awesome, thanks Kayla. So this is the hermit crab. And as you can see, it kind of looks, this is a whelk shell, it's a channel whelk shell, but there's a hermit crab living inside here. Um, so this is an, uh, another type of invertebrate, so they don't have bones, but it's a little different than our mollusks. This is called an arthropod. So as you can kind of see, he has segmented legs and there's, he has a hard exoskeleton on the front half of his body. Um, so that's covering his legs and his, the main part of his body and his little claws back down here. Um, so this hermit crab, ooh, he's really getting out of there. Ooh. Um, so this hermit crab um, protects the front half of his body with the exoskeleton, but the back half of his body is still um, soft and not very protected, and that's why he needs this shell. So he'll actually um, hook his body inside of the shell and um, carry this around with him as his home for um, the whole time he's this size. But as he grows larger, um, the this hermit crab will molt, and he'll... Um, called switch shells. So this one's kind of trying to climb out of the shell. That's why I'm kind of trying to keep them in there. Um, but whenever they're ready to switch shells, they'll um, climb over the new shell and switch really quickly. And so that they don't spend too much time outside the shell because the, the back half of their body is really soft and is really vulnerable. Um, yeah, so this is our hermit crab. Do we, 
have any questions. I also want to mention that this is a striped hermit crab, so you can see some stripes on his legs there. Um, so this is one of the types of uh, marine or aquatic hermit crabs that you will find um, out in the Skidaway River. So I'm going to put this guy back so he doesn't get too stressed out, but if we have any questions about the hermit crab, um, you can put them in the chat box now. Do we have any questions? Yes, so when the hermit crab moved back really quick into the shell, why was the animal doing that? That's a great question. Um, so the shell, like I said, is a way to protect that back half of his body that's soft and doesn't have exoskeleton, but it's also a place for him to hide. So if he feels, if the hermit crabs feel threatened, they can pull their whole body back into the shell and hide from predators and kind of just look like uh, an empty shell on the beach or something. So if they ex experience humans or other types of predators that might be um, dangerous to them, they'll hide back in that shell. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we had another question. Someone was saying that um, when they see hermit crabs on the beach, they're oftentimes out of the water. So can they breathe out of the water? Um, so hermit crabs, they can be terrestrial. At, uh, there's some types that are terrestrial and some types that are aquatic. Um, and they do, they are able to survive outside of their, outside of the water if they're aquatic for some time. Um, and so they have um, modified gills, I believe. And Kim, you can chime in as well if you have um, more details on this answer. And we can also get back to you with more details um, later on. Yeah, so just as Rachel was saying, these animals can live out of the water for a short period of time, but the animals that we're seeing today all have gills, um, which like I mentioned is different from us. We have lungs, um, so they need oxygen um, through the water. So they do need to breathe underwater for the most part, um, but they can be out of water for a short period of time. Kind of like you can hold your breath and be underwater for a short period of time, but you can't live there entirely. Fantastic. Thank you, Kim and Rachel. Um, Drew is wondering, how do you clean the shells to make sure no one is living in there? So if someone finds a shell on the beach, how do they know that they're not bringing home a hermit crab? That's a great question. You can look inside the shell. So I'm going to pick up a hermit crab we have that kind of hides back in their shell a little bit more than the one we just saw. So if you look really deep inside the shell. You might not be able to see it at this angle, but you can sometimes see, you'll see the little legs back there. So you have to look really deep inside the shell to see if there are, there's an animal living inside. Um, and for whelps, it's pretty obvious because they're, you're going to see the operculum and um, the soft body right at the front of the shell. That's awesome. And if is there any reason why you would want to leave empty shells on the beach or a certain number of empty shells on the beach? Yeah, um, so like I mentioned, hermit crabs molt, so they'll leave behind their old exoskeleton and grow a new one and get larger. And so they'll outgrow the shell that they're living in. And if you remember, whelks are the animal that make the shell. So hermit crabs don't build a new shell as they grow bigger. They have to switch into a larger shell. Um, so if you've ever had a pet hermit crab, you always have to put extra shells in their tank um, so that they can switch as they're ready. And so leaving empty shells on the beach will allow for wild hermit crabs to find a new shell and switch um, shells. Because if they're not able to find a new shell, they're not going to survive for very long. Great questions. I think those are all of the questions we have about hermit crabs. But again, if you think of more, feel free to type them in the chat box and we'll stop for more Q&A in a little bit. Awesome, thanks Kayla. So our next animal is gonna be another type of crab called a spider crab. I'm gonna go get the animal and then we'll talk a little bit about it. And you can see that Rachel is looking for the spider crab. They tend to be one of the more active animals that we have in our touch tanks. So oftentimes they move a little bit quicker than something like a whelk does. Um, so they're definitely a fun one to come and observe in person 
um, and notice how they're behaving in the tank and how they're moving around. Does anyone have any questions about any of the animals that we've seen so far? Has anyone seen an animal like the one that Rachel is holding before? Thanks for filling in there for a little bit, Kayla. Yeah, this, this uh, spider crab moves around a lot and he tends to hide um, in the, the back corners of our tank. So it's a little hard to find him. Um, but this is a spider crab. So as you can see, it looks a little similar to our hermit crab. It has that exoskeleton, but here you can see the exoskeletons on his entire body. So this um, crab does not need a shell um, to protect itself. It'll just use the exoskeleton. Um, so you can also see here the claws of the, the spider crab. Um, so very similar to the hermit crab. Again, those claws are used to, um, for feeding. So you can see he's kind of reaching. Um, he was reaching towards his mouth a little bit. Um, and so this is his mouth right here. So he'll, he'll use his, um, his claws to move food towards his mouth. And he'll also use those for defense against predators. And then if you look at the bottom of the, this spider crab, you can actually see this shape here kind of looks like the Capitol building. It's long and pointy. Um, so that is actually how we can tell that this is a male spider crab. If it was a female, this shape would be a little bit more dome-like. And that would be how you could tell pretty easily if it's a male or a female. Spider crabs are also a type of true crab. So like the hermit crab, they're tr uh, true crabs, so they have this exoskeleton, um, and they also have 10 legs. Um, that's one of the defining features as well of the tr as a true crab. Um, and so this spider crab actually doesn't have all 10 of his legs. So if we counted them, we have one, two, three, four on this side. And then on this side, we have one, two, three, four, five. So he has nine legs right now. So he's missing one leg on this left side here. Um, and that's actually because spider crabs use um, a very interesting way to get away from predators. If they feel threatened and they feel like their legs are being pulled or something, they can actually drop their legs and they'll be able to run away and protect this more important part of their body here because as they molt, so as they shed their exoskeleton, they'll be able to slowly regrow those legs. So this, this guy will slowly regrow that leg back um, unless they're on their terminal molt, which means their last molt, then it's a lot more harmful to them to lose those legs. So if you're ever handling a spider crab in a touch tank or in, um, in a controlled environment like that, we wanna hold him by his body like I'm doing now because his natural response will be to drop those legs. And that's, that can be harmful if he's dropping more than one at a time. Um, also with the legs, you can see they're kind of pointed here. So this is a walking crab. He'll walk on the bottom and um, they actually can latch onto animals like uh, cannonball jellies when they're small. So they get a free ride um, through the water because they're not super fast. Um, walking on the bottom when they're small. The last uh, fun fact about the spider crab is they're actually called decorator crabs. So on his back here, there's some little notches and points. So if um, this spider crab was in the wild and had things like algae or sponge or corals, they can pick up those things and put them on their back and actually decorate their back. And it kind of acts as a form of camouflage so that they're not seen as easily by predators. So that's some um, facts about this spider crab. Did we have any questions about this animal before we move on? We did. Um, someone was wondering, how do you know that it's the terminal molt or that last molt when they're as big as they're gonna get? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure for spider crabs specifically, but um, some animals you'll actually be able to tell just by uh, size um, and but I'm not sure exactly like um, what traits you'd be able to see on their shell that would help you to be able to tell. Um, but we can get back to you on that one. Yes, that's a great question. We'll get back to you on that. Um, Cassandra was wondering, how long does it take for the spider crabs to grow its legs back? Yeah, it's going to be pretty slow. Um, 
they can't completely pop off a new leg, um, but every molt they'll be able to grow a little bit more of that back. Um, so I'm not exactly sure about the exact timeline in terms of the amount of molts that it would take. Um, but Kim, if you wanna jump in and add any specific details about that timeline. Um, yeah, so as Rachel was saying, they can grow them back um, through the molts. So it might take a little while, but it usually takes a roughly just a few months, like two or three months for them to be able to get the full leg back. Awesome. Thank you, Kim. Um, we also have someone wondering how big can spider crabs get? Again, I, I'm not sure the specific answer to that question, but we can get back to you on that one. Um, Kim, you can chime in, chime in too if you know. Um, so for these ones in particular, the species of spider crab, I can't tell you exactly how big they get. I know that the ones we have in our aquarium are usually just around the size that Rachel is holding now, but there are different species of spider crabs, um, like deep sea spider crabs that can get very, very large, um, like the size of humans or larger. So it depends on what species of spider crabs that you're talking about specifically. Um, and we did have a question about whether or not we are going to see any fish. Um, so I'll let, let folks know that we aren't going to see any fish in our touch tanks because um, all the animals in our touch tanks are invertebrates. So they don't have any bone bones, but we will be showing a lot of fish next week. So if you're interested in fish, uh, join us next week at 11 and we'll actually be going behind the scenes of the aquarium with the curator Devin Dumont to learn about some of the other exhibits and the animals that live there, including a really wide variety of fish species that we can find in Georgia. And I think that those are all of the questions that we had about the spider crab, Rachel, at least at this point. Awesome, those are great questions. Um, and I'm glad that you guys are enjoying uh, learning about them. So I'm gonna go grab our last animal um, and we'll get to learn a little bit about that. And then we'll show, I'll show you a feeding of our horseshoe crabs. So this is called a horseshoe crab. Um, so as you can see, it's kind of shaped as a horseshoe in um, the, this region of its body here. Um, and so that's kind of where it gets its name from. But this is actually not a true crab. So I talked a little bit about true crabs. I talked a little bit about true crabs before. Um, and, but this one does not have the 10 legs like I mentioned with the spider crabs and the hermit crabs. Um, so does anyone have a guess to how many legs that horseshoe crabs have? You can type it in the chat box and then we're gonna actually count them to see. Okay, so we haven't gotten any answers yet, but we'll go ahead and count the legs. Oh, do we have some answers, Kayla? Yes, so we have a guess for six, we have a guess for a lot, we have a guess for eight, and another one for eight as well. Okay, so um, you guys are close, but we're going to actually go ahead and count them. Let me see if you can get the right angle on there. So if you want to go ahead and try to count the legs, um, I'm not going to actually point them out because um, this guy's pretty slippery, so I don't want him to fall. Um, but there's actually 12 legs, if you can see all of them. And Kayla, let me know if I need to tilt it in a different direction. Um, but there's actually 12 different legs that the horseshoe crabs have. So they have uh, six pairs of legs. So one more pair than the um, spider crabs and the hermit crabs and other true crabs. Also, this pair of legs here um, that's a lot smaller is called the chelicera. Um, Hold on, I'm having a little bit of computer problem. There you go. Um, so we have the chelicera right here. So they're very small little legs that help move food towards the mouth of the horseshoe crab. And those are very similar to chelicera on spiders or scorpions. And so horseshoe crabs are actually more related to spiders and scorpions than other true crabs. Okay. So I also wanted to mention these um, animals are one of the oldest living animals on earth. Um, so they're, they are sometimes called a living fossil um, and their body plan has not changed much since um, they first existed on earth. So it's, it's working pretty well for this guy. 
Um, and as you can see right here, these are a couple of one type of eye that he has. So this is one of the compound eyes and there's another one on the other side. Um, and so that eye is very similar to a fly's eye and um, can see kind of like an insect would see. So many different images of the world around them. Um, there's also a bunch of different simple eyes. So he actually has 10 different eyes on his body. Um, so there's simple eyes right behind the compound eye at the front of the uh, this region here. And then there's also some um, on the tail and underneath that help to, to see light and dark and um, help for the circadian rhythm of this animal. Um, and so I mentioned the tail. So some people may think that this is a stingray because um, this looks very much like a stinger. It's actually not. So you can see that I'm touching it here. It kind of just feels like a bone. There are some spikes on the, their telson or their tail, um, but those are just to protect the animal. It's not um, intended to be used as a stinger. Um, does anyone have an idea of what the telson might be used for? I'll circle back to that in a little bit. Um, but if you have any ideas, you can go ahead and put the, that in the chat box. Um, also, in the underneath part of the animal here, there's the book gills. So um, their gills there have to stay damp. So I can keep them out of the water for a little bit of time, but we have to make sure the, the gills stay damp. So they'll come up to the beaches on high tides um, to uh, spawn on the beaches and they'll just have to make sure that they don't get caught above the tide. You can see strandings of hermit crab or horseshoe crabs sometimes um, if they get caught above the tide and can't get back to the water. Um, but most of the time they're able to get, get back into the water before the tide goes back out. Um, and horseshoe crabs are a really ecologically important species as well. Um, so I'm gonna put this one down real quick to show you um, what their eggs look like. So horseshoe crabs actually have a green coloration to their eggs. Um, so this is actually what they would look like in real life. These are um, not real horseshoe crab eggs, but they're the same color and size. And so these eggs will actually be used as a great nutrient source for shorebirds shore um, and some other animals that uh, migrate along the coast. And so horseshoe crabs um, really help um, for those animals because they'll time their migration to the, sh the horseshoe crab spawning. Um, another thing about horseshoe crabs is that they can be used um, for medical re research. So their blood is copper-based, um, unlike ours, that's iron-based. And so they can they actually use these horseshoe crab, the horseshoe crab blood to um, test medical equipment and test for different bacteria that you wouldn't be able to with um, normal human blood. So they'll um, put a needle right here in this part of the, the animal and um, bleed them, but then they can be returned to the wild without too much um, disruption to their life. Um, so that's another really important um, an important uh, benefit of these the species. So did we have any answers to what the telson is used for? We did. We had an answer about navigation. We had one for protection. And they also had Rachel saying that she thinks that it allows the animal, the horseshoe crab, to flip itself over if it's on its back. Yeah. Oh, age of swimming was another as well. Awesome. Yeah, so the main, um, the main purpose of this telson here is um, what Rachel had mentioned. So they are gonna use this to flip themselves over if they get caught upside down, if they're knocked over by the tide or other animals or currents, um, they'll dig the their telson into the sand and then they'll be able to flip themselves over um, to get back onto the right, their right side and be able to continue swimming through the water. Um, but whenever they are juveniles, they'll actually use this tail as a rudder. So they'll swim on their back when they're really small and kind of move this up, the telson up and down um, to swim through the water. So we had some great answers there. Um, and it also will be used somewhat with, for protection. So that's why there are like some spiky parts to the telson, but that's not the main purpose of it. And um, something to be aware of too is this the telson is only attached by one muscle right here. So we never wanna be picking up horseshoe crabs by their telson because that would be like picking you up by your pinky finger. That wouldn't be very comfortable. It would probably put, um, 
cause damage to this muscle and then they wouldn't be able to use the telcin as it's intended and wouldn't be able to survive um, as well in the wild. So if you're ever holding a horseshoe crab, you wanna hold it kind of like I am by um, this head region here. Awesome, are there any more questions about horseshoe crabs before I get into a feeding? There are, so John is wondering what color blood they have. Um, I'm not sure exactly what color it is. Um, Kevin, you know you can chime in or we can get back to you. Um, and then we also had a question about how long can they stay out of the water for? Like I said, they have to, um, that's a great question. Like I said, they have to keep their gills moist. So as long as their gills are moist, um, they'll be able to stay out of the water. So if it's hotter, there's more sun um, on the beach, they might have a shorter period of time that they can stay out of the water. But normally for spawning, they're gonna be doing that at night um, with a full moon and a high tide. Um, so that'll be, they'll have hopefully enough time to get back into the water. Um, but that's why you'll see some stranded on the beach because they'll get stuck above the tide and then the hot sun will dry them out. Yeah, so off of what Rachel was saying with that one, as long as their gills are still damp, kind of like the hermit crabs that we talked about before, they need to breathe underwater. Um, they have gills instead of lungs, but as long as their gills are still damp, they're gonna be able to survive out of that water for a while. Um, so nighttime is a little bit better because the sun isn't drying their gills out. Um, but to revert back to the question you had before about the color of the horseshoe crab blood, it actually is blue blood um, like ours. We actually use horseshoe crab blood for a lot of our medical testing, it is copper based. Um, so it's actually really great for a lot of our medical testing. Um, and they do have a lot of regulations on it. So we can't take excess amounts of horseshoe crab blood. Um, and they do have a mortality rate that they have to keep. I think it's under 5% or so, but it is a low mortality rate. So they can't take um, a bunch and just take all their blood and move on. So we do try and be as best as um, humane as possible when taking the blood from these animals. Yeah, and also kind of tacking onto that too, um, Marine Extension was actually uh, working on funding a project to see if we can actually farm these horseshoe crabs um, to just use the same individuals um, for this bleeding process rather than continuously taking uh, new individuals out of the wild ecosystem. So to Kim's point, they're trying to keep mortality low, but it is really useful for medical testing. So great questions. Do we have any others um, before we move on? Not at this time. If you think of any, feel free to, to type those in the chat box, but not at this point. Cool, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to a feeding of a horseshoe crab. So I'm gonna try my best to get a good angle on this. I'm using a computer, so it's a little bit tricky, but I'm gonna grab one of our larger horseshoe crabs and then I'm gonna get their food and show you exactly where their mouth is and where we're gonna feed them today. I'll be right back. And you can be trying to imagine while she's grabbing the horseshoe crab what you think it might be eating. Um, maybe your stomach is starting to get a little bit grumbly right before lunch. Um, they probably aren't eating what we're eating necessarily. So we've shown a picture of food prep earlier in the slideshow. Um, but now you get to see in person what they're actually eating. So this is a piece of fish here that we cut up. So it's not too big of a piece. It's maybe a little less than an inch or so. Um, and that's gonna be what we're gonna use to feed the horseshoe crabs. So their mouth is kind of right in the center here. So I'm gonna give him the food. So he's pretty hungry. Um, he ate it right up. Um, and so this is how we're gonna feed them in the aquarium. We use tongs like this, and we just put the food right on their mouth. Um, I'm gonna give him another piece of fish here. Um, but in the wild, horseshoe crabs are scavengers. So they're gonna walk along the bottom and use their scissor-like legs to grab food and move it towards you, it hits their mouth. And if it's not food, they'll just spit it back out. So here's another piece of fish. You can see him eat in there. Um, and this horseshoe crab is also one of our larger ones. So this is close to its terminal molt. Okay. 
And as you can see, he's kind of moving his legs towards his mouth, so kind of acting as if he was trying to grab the food out of his environment. Um, but we want we feed our, our animals like this so that we know that each individual horseshoe crab is eating enough food and getting the nutrients that they need to survive well in our touch tanks. And then this here's a piece of shrimp. Um, so this is about the same size we cut up for them. So here he goes. This horseshoe crab eats very quickly. He's hungry today. So normally we'll feed um, the touch tanks and most of our other tanks on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So only three times a week. So this is, he'll, he's getting an extra snack today because it's not a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. I have a couple more pieces of shrimp for him to eat. And you can see he's getting a little bit slower with the eating because he's not as hungry now. We normally feed them about four or five pieces of food every feeding. This is very similar to what you might eat fish and shrimp. Awesome, so that was our last piece of food for the horseshoe crab. But while I have this one up, I wanted to show um, one of the ways that you can actually tell that this is a male horseshoe crab. He's getting a little bit finicky now, but this second appendage here is actually hook shaped. I don't know if you can see on the screen, but it's kind of shaped like a hook like this. Um, and on females, it's gonna just be a scissor like this as um, that second appendage. So that's one of the ways that you can see when they're older, if um, they're male or female. When they're younger, they're not, you're not, they're not gonna develop that hook yet. Um, but if it's an older, larger horseshoe crab, you'll be able to tell um, with that second appendage. So I'm gonna put him back in the water. But if you have any questions about feeding or other things you thought about about any of the animals, go ahead and put them in the, those questions in the chat box now. And in addition, we would really like to hear feedback from you. This is the first summer that we are offering virtual programming. Um, so we really do value your feedback um, and we'll use that throughout the summer and moving forward uh, to make these programs as best as they can be. Um, our survey only takes one minute to fill out and I have put the link to that survey in our chat box. Um, so you can either click on it now. Um, you can also copy and paste that link into another browser window because once we end the meeting, that chat box will go away. Um, so just make sure that you either click it open now or copy and paste before the end. Um, and again, if anyone has questions, please feel free to add those in the chat box. And if you had fun today, I hope that you join us again next week, uh, Tuesday at 11 a.m. Every Tuesday at 11 a.m. we'll be seeing different types of topics um, and tours here at the aquarium. Um, also every Thursday at 2 p.m. we'll be doing another series um, for younger audiences. So that's for families with children ages four to eight years old, and that'll be every Thursday. And a full schedule of all of our events you can find at our website. Um, so I will put that in the chat box as well. Um, so any more information that you need on those, you can find on our website. Um, I do also wanna do a big thank you um, to both of our educators, uh, Kim and Rachel, and also to our friends of the aquarium, um, because they really support the work that we're able to do this summer in terms of offering uh, virtual programs and educational programs. Um, and if you're interested in what it means to be a friend of the aquarium or want to find out how to become one, um, you can go ahead and look on our website, gacoast.uga.edu, and find more information there. Um, there's also other ways to stay connected with us. Um, again, you can join us for future programs. Um, and then you can also follow us on social media. Uh, these are all of our different accounts on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and our website there. Um, and also for families, if you're looking for other activities in between programs to do at home, on our website, we do have a whole page of educational resources um, with worksheets and activities and fun experiments to do at home. Um, so thank you again so much for coming. We really appreciate you attending um, and we hope to see you next week. And as a reminder, um, please do fill out that survey and we'll listen to what you say and incorporate it into our future programs. And it doesn't look like we have um, any other questions at this point. So we will let you go ahead and get to lunch unless Rachel or Kim, do you have any last words? 
I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming. I hope you learned something new and had a great time today. Uh, live teaching is a little new for us virtually, but hopefully it worked well and you were able to see all the animals. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so glad that uh, you could join us today. Thanks and enjoy your afternoon. See you next week.